Γεια σα, everyone. I'm Gregory Contest of Greek Ancestry and I'd like to welcome you all to day two of the International Greek Ancestry Conference sponsored by Greek Ancestry and the Hellenic Genealogy Geek. Uh, in yesterday's sessions, we covered archival repositories and records, as well as village history projects. The sessions have been recorded and are available on Greek Ancestry's YouTube channel. Today, we are starting with a special session on the 1821 revolution against the Ottomans, the Greek War of Independence, with Professor Roderick Beaton, followed by an interview with Yanis Michalakakos about 19th century village life. Today's third session will be about migration, featuring Professor Alexander Kitroev and Professor Honda Van Steen, and me. Um, let me introduce uh, our first guest, Roderick Beaton. Um, he grew up in Edinburgh and studying English literature at Peterhouse, Cambridge, before returning to modern Greek as the subject of his doctorate, also at Cambridge. After a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Birmingham, he embarked on a long career at King's College London, first as lecturer in modern Greek language and literature, later as Korais, professor of modern Greek and Byzantine history, language and literature, and since then as emeritus. From 2012 to 2018, he also served as director of the Center for Hellenic Studies at King's. Roderick is the author of many books and articles about aspects of, Greek, of the Greek speaking world from the 12th century to the present day, including an introduction to modern Greek literature, George Seferi's Waiting for the Angel, a biography, Byron's War, Romantic Rebellion, Greek Revolution, all three of which won the prestigious Ronsiman Award for Best Book on the Hellenic World, and Greece's Biography of a Modern Nation. His latest book, an other overview of Greek history from the Bronze Age to the 20, 200th anniversary of the Greek Revolution 2021, is expected to be published in fall uh, 2021 with the title, The Greeks, A Global History. So uh, welcome, Professor. Uh, and I'm more than honored to be given the opportunity to interview you today. Uh, thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you for those kind words of introduction. Hello, Gregory, glad to meet you. And uh, hello, everyone who's, uh, who's listening. That's a very generous uh, introduction you gave me. I appreciate it. And I hope to live up to, live up to your kind words in the, in the next few uh, little while. So far away. Um, so um, when, we, when we decided we want to host a session about the revolution and started thinking about the things we would like to know, we realized that this revolution has acquired legendary and mythical dimensions. We know about all the heroes, but nothing about ordinary people, the people who fought, those who sacrificed their lives, the people who stayed behind to take care of their families. So it seems we have a, a linear and sometimes reductive understanding of the revolution. We do not realize its complexity, its heterogeneities, we did not realize that it was not obvious at all that the revolution would eventually have a successful outcome. So today we would like to learn more about this revolution, what it was like and what it meant for our ancestors and their families. And we would like you to, to set the stage for this discussion by describing um, the contemporary Greek world. What was the identity of the Greek people? Was national identity developed and spread enough how diverse was the population? Sure. Well, I mean, it wasn't, um, I mean, you know, what we now call national identity was really kind of in its infancy in those days. It was a developing way of thinking and the creation of the Greek nation state was actually part of that whole European process. But I mean, I think perhaps the first thing to say is that, you know, is that before, the, before 1821, the Greek world, or as I often, I like to gloss it in English, the Greek speaking world, um, which is my equivalent of the Greek term Ellings Mors, but the Greek speaking world, it really is stretched and it was kind of scattered all the way from the Ionian islands off the west coast of Greece in the west, right across the Balkans to the north and the Aegean Sea and Crete to the south, as far as Cyprus in one direction and as far as Pondos and Trebizond in the other one of the largest Greek centers of population anywhere was the capital of the Ottoman Empire, Constantinople. 
So there were Greek, you know, there were there was a Greek Orthodox population um, widely dispersed right across all these areas. Um, under and except in the in the Ionian Islands, they were all under Ottoman rule. There were also by that time quite large Greek communities of people who had moved to southern Russia, what is today um, Ukraine and Crimea and uh, the Black Sea coast of uh, modern Russia. Um, they'd been invited there by Catherine the Great and they went in large numbers and many of them became, um, you know, they spoke Russian fluently, they became closely, many of them rose to high positions in the Russian Empire, um, someone who we'll very probably mention later, Ioannis Kapodistrias, the first governor of independent Greece, um, actually was a Greek who had done so well in the Imperial Russian civil service that for several years, he was foreign minister of Russia. So there's a substantial, sizable Greek population integrated into uh, the Russian empire. Um, and to complicate matters further, and again with an important part in this story, there are a whole scattering of quite small but very close-knit Greek Orthodox um, merchant families who'd gone abroad to establish, basically to make, um, to, to make money, to, to build careers in cities all over Western Europe from I mean, beginning in Venice and Vienna, which were kind of closest to the Greek speaking world. But by, by 1800, um, they reached as far as London and Amsterdam and Paris. Um, and it wouldn't be long. In fact, I think even before that, the first Greeks were beginning to cross the Atlantic to the United States. Um, in fact, there was a famous Greek who was um, already in the Argentine Navy, apparently, in the Argentinian War of Independence about the same time. So. It's not a short, I'm sorry, it's not a short answer, but it's not a simple question either. You know, who are the Greeks and where are they? They're already in quite a lot of different places. So in what later became the, the independent Greek state, hmm. the population, were they all Greek speaking? Were they all Orthodox? Uh, well, I mean, you know, they were all subject to the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire had many different languages. It um, accepted and tolerated many different, or several different religious faiths. Um, so it was actually, it was actually quite a cosmopolitan kind of place. It was polyglot. I mean, I mean, nowadays there's a slight tendency among you know people in terms of late 20th century multiculturalism to kind of idealize the Ottoman Empire and say, well, you know, it was tolerant, it was inclusive. Um, it wasn't very tolerant, it did include, but not in a very modern or necessarily very amicable kind of way. But um, the result of the way the Ottomans organized their empire was basically a kind of, you know, it's a kind of pyramid structure. You, you got the Sultan at the very top. It was theocratic, it was Islamic. The, <clears throat> the upper classes were all, um, were all Muslim, um, and those who were non-Muslims were subject to discriminatory taxes and <clears throat> uh, could be treated in various unpleasant ways um, in particular circumstances. Um, so, um, you know, in that world, the area that we call Greece had no sort of distinctive identity at all. And the population, the makeup of the population, so far as we can tell, we don't always know in, in that much detail, but Certainly in the in the Peloponnese and uh, probably all the islands of the Aegean and Crete, <clears throat> the great majority spoke Greek. Um, in most of these places, the great majority also were Orthodox. And really, the Orthodox religion um, is, I think, the, you know, is the key to understanding those whom nowadays we call Greeks um, at this time. What they have in common is the Orthodox religion and the you know, they worship in the language of the New Testament, uh, the original language of Christianity, and whatever language they speak at home, which is not always Greek, um, if they are educated, or if they're merchants who are keeping records and so on, they're all doing that in Greek. So a lot of the, you know, a lot of the heroes of the revolution, um, particularly the ones who came from the islands of Idra and Spetses, their first language was, was a dialect of Albanian called Arvanitika in Greek, but it's a dialect of Albania. It's not Greek at all. Um, um, you know, and elsewhere, um, uh, 
uh, people were were, were Vlachi, they were Valachians, um, another great political leader, um, uh, Ioannis Koletis, who came from Ranina, uh, came from a vlach speaking family. So his, his first language would have been a dialect of today's Romanian. Um, I think one thing that is true to say is that at least in the southern part of Greece and in the islands, there were very few of those who we would like from nowadays probably call ethnic Turks. There was never really much um, attempt by the Ottomans at colonizing uh, those places. Even in Crete, where um, there were a lot of Muslims, um, unusually in the Ottoman Empire, Cretan Muslims all spoke Greek, um, not, uh, not Turkish. Um, so, and the other thing was, is that, I mean, just about everybody, even quite humble people, would have been used to doing daily business um, in different languages. You know, you use one language for the priest, another if you go to the, have to go to the Ottoman authorities, and you might use a third, uh, a third at home. If you're doing business, you might be doing business with people speaking three or four different languages. So you've got that, you know, it's really, it's really quite uh, quite mixed, but certainly in the southern part of today's Greece and the islands, I think there's no doubt the Greek speakers are in the majority, um, and the majority of them certainly are Orthodox Christians. As you go further north, it gets a bit more complicated. Um, uh, Thessaly and Macedonia, Epirus, uh, populations are far more mixed, and the Christian pop in those areas, the Christian populations have a sense of being, they call themselves um, Rom, Romi or Rum in Turkish. It was Christianity, Orthodox Christianity that united them. And the different ethnicities that would later emerge in the Balkans, really that's something that developed in the 19th century. It's not very strong before 1821. So it's as well to think of, you know, the lands that would become modern Greece as sort of ethnically and linguistically and in religious terms, a bit of a patchwork out of which the ethnicity that we know today emerged. And the key fact that made that happen, of course, was the revolution of 1821. So the religion or orthodoxy was what united uh, Greek speaking populations, but also others, Albanian speaking, black speaking. Um, but it was also what distinguished them uh, from the Muslims and this, uh, this distinction, um, it was what caused this systemic um, unfairness. <laughs> um, but this was something that was going on for centuries, right? Since the Ottomans firstly occupied the country. Exactly. Why did you know? Why did it not happen for uh, almost four hundred years? So, so exactly. What was the the spark? What what was the you, we could call the main cause of the revolution. Was it that suddenly national identity became, um, you know, a priority or were there other factors involved? Well, I mean, there are a lot of factors involved and, you know, as always with historical causation, you know, it's a sort of classic university history essay, you know, what were the causes of? And, uh, you know, you, you could go on and on. Um, let me hazard this one. I think it was 1776 and the United States Declaration of Independence, the rights of man and the idea of liberty. That had never really emerged as a political concept in that way before. The same idea and very much of the same intellectual underpinnings in the European Enlightenment um, took violent political form once again in 1789 at the beginning of the French Revolution. So as we all know in hindsight, the American Revolution succeeded and uh, there you are, bless you all. Uh, the French Revolution, um, I'm always a little nervous with my French friends and colleagues that saying this, but you know, it can't be counted as an entire success, though of course it did lay the basis for much of modern France and much of modern Europe. But, um, you know, the French Revolution led to the Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon was defeated so that revolutionary, the idea of liberty, equality, fraternity in Europe was very thoroughly quashed at the end of those wars in 1815. But just because the Napoleon didn't 
well, what was Napoleon trying to do by that time? But anyway, the French Revolution didn't lead to a new lasting political creation as the American one did. But they were both founded on the same principles. And I think to you know, boil it down to essentials, the idea, it is a single word of liberty. And right across Europe, whatever side people were on, whether they loved the French or were occupied by them and came to hate them, um, you know, lots of people were fired up by this idea of liberty. Um, and tied to that is the idea of self-determination. I mean, that again is in the American uh, Declaration of Independence. It, it is the people in some way, um, not specified, who really determine their own fate, their own destiny, their own future. And that idea, you know, lit a long fuse that ran right through, first of all, through the, the Americas, don't forget, you know, the North America was uh, followed by the South American wars of independence against um, Spanish and Portuguese rule. But that long fuse ran right across Europe as well. And after 1815 and after the de defeat of, the, of Napoleon, there were lots of people who'd been in, you know, who were old enough to have been inspired by the French Revolution, perhaps horrified at what it led to, but also nostalgic for that these hopes, these ideals that had been unleashed. So you couldn't put that idea of liberty back in its box. And all over Europe, there are lots of people talking about liberty, writing about liberty, wherever they were allowed to. Um, and in many places they weren't. And because they weren't, a lot of them also formed secret societies and they plotted in the dark. And between around about 1820, 1821, there were about four or five revolutions in different parts of Europe, in Spain, in southern Italy, in northern Italy, in Piedmont, there was one planned in northern Italy, it didn't happen. Um, uh, none of those lasted for, for any time, any time at all. But that sort of mentality, that ferment for freedom was around in Europe. And the one corner of Europe where I think nobody would have expected it to happen was actually not in you know, Christian ruled Europe at all, but among the Christian subjects of the Ottoman Empire. And 1821, the Greek revolution was about the fourth or fifth in a series of revolutions sparked by a revolutionary secret society inspired by the ideas of the French and American revolutions. Unlike all the others, the Greek one worked. And it's another question why. Right. Um, so, so we're talking about a religious community that is looking for self-determination and liberation, right? So, I mean, yeah. it is not so much, is it so much about uh, civil rights um, and national liberation, or is it more about uh, religious uh, a, a more, uh, let's say, uniform, the creation of a uniform religious um, community territory. Yeah, no, you're, I mean, you're absolutely right. And this is where the, this is where the position gets complicated because the people who are, who are most directly and in, uh, you know, um, most directly intellectually inspired by the uh, revolutions in the Americas and in France are the educated Greeks, the intellectuals. And these are the ones who are fully plugged into intellectual currents and ideas in Europe. And this is, at the time, uh, this is a minority of Greeks um, for whom the, you know, the gold standard and the, this, the new standard for their own identity is one that their European contemporaries are themselves holding up as an example, namely ancient Greeks, the Hellenes, of old. So among the intellectuals, the cry for freedom, if you like, is understood as self-determination, as you say, um, sort of civic responsibilities, and it naturally becomes linked to the heritage of the, that comes with the language of uh, ancient Greek civilization. So this is, these are the people who are still a minority at the time, who around about 1800, 
really begin quite consciously and deliberately to revive the term Hellenes to describe themselves. Whereas up until that time, Hellenes in Greek were nearly always reserved for the ancient Greeks, whereas contemporary Greeks call themselves Romyi, which literally means Romans. But on the ground, the majority who are fighting for their, you're absolutely right, it's for their religious identity and the, the you know, their freedom as Orthodox Christians, they too have clearly taken on board in their own very varying ways the single concept of freedom, of liberty. And that in turn leads to, well, it must be one of the reasons that the revolution succeeded, but it also leads to one of the reasons that the revolution came close to not succeeding, which was what, which was that once the Greeks had begun to win their freedom in 1823 and 1824, in the very middle of their struggle for independence, they actually fell out very badly among themselves because different groups and different individuals had deeply clashing ideas of what this single concept of liberty meant. Um, it's not, I tend not to think of it in terms of secularists against sort of the Orthodox religion because there's not really much of a secularist um, sort of movement at all in Greece. There's no anti-clericalism, for example, at all as there was in the European Enlightenment. But there are those for whom the Hellenic heritage kind of comes first and, with, and for them, the new Republican ideas of the Enlightenment are what matter most. And there are those for whom liberty is a more kind of local, immediate affair. So it's Orthodox Christians simply fighting to, for the, the freedom to run their own mountains and valleys or island in their own, uh, in their own way. Um, so those factions, are, they're sometimes called modernists or the kind of, you know, outward looking, um, you know, sort of state building architects of the Greek state as it later developed. And the, um, the other, the, um, you know, who then clashed with those whom historians now call the, the warlords, the people who actually did the fighting on the ground, but weren't frankly very interested in political theory at all. Um, you know, I think it's doing no disservice to the memory of famous names in Greek history to say that, you know, someone like Theodoros Kolokotronis or, or the Isaias Androutsos would, you know, the, the real goal for these people was to, you know, was to be boss, was to be top dog, to be able to, like commando, as you say in Greek, right. to be able to tell people what to do. Um, they really, they just weren't, you know, they weren't educated in a, in a way that would make them interested in political theory. Um, it was practical politics, and you know, let's be honest, it was pretty rough and pretty brutal because you know that's the way life was in those days. Right. So we have different groups, uh, different power groups. We have different priorities. Would you say that the mass, the ordinary people, they were more willing to run and un to, to go to fight under the flag of religion? So that was their main uh, motivation. Oh yeah, I think it. I think it was. Um, but again, if you remember, I mean, the famous, you know, the banner and the slogan was always "Eletheria i Thanatos," liberty or death. And you could take a, that would encapsulate a lot of different priorities or ideologies, and um, you know that was one that everyone could. Uh, could subscribe to. But yes, I think for the, for the great majority of the rank and file, it was, it was a religious war. And I mean, you can see that also in some of the, you know, in some of the terrible stories, because, um, you know, Christians massacred Muslims, Muslims massacred Christians. Um, and, you know, sadly, tragically, um, uh, the, the, um, Jewish communities got massacred too, um, because they weren't Orthodox. You know, they spoke Greek, um, but it wasn't enough. It was, the, it was, it was, you know, it really meant Orthodoxy for um, 
uh, or death. But the political organization was, um, was built along the lines of the American and French Revolution, so that the, right from the beginning, there was a national assembly, there was a provisional constitution, um, there were three such assemblies, or, um, or three and a half, there was a fourth, it didn't really get, it lasted very long. Um, and there were several provisional constitutions. Um, I mean, to digress, one of the ironies about the Greek uh, War of Independence, which, I mean, revolution, I mean, it was a time of complete anarchy, but during those 10 years, there was, at least in theory, there was, a, you know, an, a constitution was in force and had been voted on according to quite advanced, you know, theoretical um, political principles. On the other hand, for the first 10 years after order had been restored and Greece became a proper nation state with a proper, in inverted commas, monarch to rule it, there was no constitution at all. You know, one, one of the things that uh, civilizing Europe did to Greece was actually deprive it of the constitution that the Greeks had created for themselves. Um, that was only for 10 years, the, um, from 1844, as you know, of course, there was a constitution and a very advanced one. Right, interesting. Um, so, uh, who fights in the revolution? Who, who does this revolutionary army uh, consist of? Um, no, are there like all the males? Uh, how how is the army? How how do soldiers come together? How is the army? Well, yeah, it's worse than that, Gregory. There is no army. Everybody fights, and you have no choice. Because once the first shot is fired, the Ottoman reprisals were so indiscriminate and so disproportionate that anyone who's involved in revolution anywhere, you once it starts, you've just got to take up arms and you know and kill anyone who comes after you. Because if you don't, they're going to kill you. Um, the the victories were not won by regular soldiers; they were run run by guerrilla groups. It was very like very like well, I mean the partisans in the Second World War modeled themselves very much on these guerrilla groups. But it was that kind of, it was all irregular warfare. Every time the <clears throat> provisional government and every time the Philhellenes, those brave volunteers from Europe and America who went to help, every time they tried to organize a regular army and drill soldiers and you know, get everybody standing in line obeying orders, it was a complete flop. And, um, the first regular army in independent Greece got wiped out at <clears throat> the Battle of Peta in 1822. At the very same time, um, within about a couple of weeks of it, when Theodoros Kolokotronis led a band of his irregulars and trapped a huge organized Ottoman army um, between Naftlun and Corinth at the Battle of Zervanakia, and they just massacred it. But, you know, the, um, it was guerrilla tactics that worked. But it, there wasn't really, you know, there was no, there was very little what we would call military discipline. Um, there wasn't much organization either. It was, um, or coordination. It was, um, it was groups led by charismatic leaders um, who um, sometimes just kind of went on the rampage and, um, you know, um, they, they, they killed the Muslims. But they knew that if they didn't, the Muslims were going to kill them. So yes, so the, so the short answer is every, everybody is fighting, everybody who can. And um, I mean, there are stories of, you know, there are famous stories of women taking up arms as well. There's, uh, you know, uh, Bubulina in Idra who, who, captain, who owned and I think captained her own ship, uh, Mandoma Vrogenus in the islands. Um, but I think at a, at a lower, <clears throat> lower level too, I mean, everybody who could wield a, a musket or a, a, a gra, they called it, the old fashioned muskets. Um, you know, everybody could, or, or even just a, a dagger or a sword, they would, you know, they pick it up and they, they defend themselves. And if the opportunity arose, again, pretty, sometimes pretty horrifically, they'd fall upon the other side and, uh, and kill them. No, nobody, you know, I don't think anybody, but there wasn't, a, there was no room for conscientious objectors, put it that way. Right. So like, we, we have a, a society which is pushed to war, pushed, yeah, to some extent pushed. Um, yeah. Okay, so away from the battlefield, what happens 
in, in the villages? What happens, uh, how does the revolution impact ordinary families? Well, again, it, I mean, it depends where you are. I mean, in the Peloponnese and the southern half of mainland Greece, um, it, it really, I mean, it really goes back to what I was saying before. I mean, everybody was involved and there was no real escape from that. Um, men, ex, you know, it's, if you're a man, it's kill or be killed. Uh, women, um, we were talking about before, I mean, I think it's um, one aspect of this that it's well worth reminding ourselves of that, um, you know, the Ottomans had a very sophisticated slave market and it was routine for um, women and children um, who were captured in war to be um, to be taken to the slave to taken to the slave market and uh, and sold, um, and this this happened to tens of thousands of I was going to say Greek women, but I mean actually almost any Christian women, any any women who were on the wrong side who were caught up in these um, in these violent uh, in these violent events, and I mean even. I mean, even in some parts of the Greek-speaking community, you know, some, some Greeks did try to stay out of it. Um, the famous example is the island of Chios, um, which, um, I mean, it suffered a particularly tragic fate, but one of the ironies of that fate is that, I mean, Chios was a rich island because the, um, it was where the, the, the mastic trees grew and the, the farmers and the merchants who, um, of Chios were Greek, were very, got, grew very rich on having almost a monopoly of this luxury product that kept the ladies of the Sultan's harem in Constantinople in chewing gum. Um, so they didn't want any, they wouldn't have, wanted nothing to do with the <clears throat> revolution because it was going to ruin their market. What happened? Um, a bunch of much more aggressive Greeks from a much more aggressive island, Samos, not far away to the south, landed on the shore of Chios, ran amok, um, started killing the Muslim authorities, um, and there was nothing the Chios could do. And it was a classic case again of this extraordinarily violent and extraordinarily disproportionate system of Ottoman reprisal. Um, the majority of Chios males were massacred. The majority of Chios women were sold into slavery although the actual aggressors had not come from Chios at all. Um, so that is a kind of salutary tale. But the massacre of Chios, as I'm, I'm sure you know, is one of, you know, it's one of the sort of horror stories of the Greek War of Independence. It's, it's also one that sent shockwaves around the whole of Europe. It inspired the famous painting by Delacroix. And <clears throat> I mean, again, I think it's another example of something I was saying before that one of the, <clears throat> things that not that helped, but one that fueled the success of the revolution was the sheer horror of the Ottoman reprisals, which were so extreme as to provoke um, not just the, the victims, but actually, you know, people all over the world to, to, you know, to look on in horror and think, you know, surely, you know, we can't allow this. It, um, it's sometimes said, I think this is not, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration, it's sometimes said that what we now call humanitarian intervention, interventionism, mm -hmm. really began during the Greek Revolution. I'm not sure that's quite true, but the instincts that led to it, I think, did. And even some, you know, even some notorious politicians in the West who were dead against any revolution, and certainly against the Greek one, um, were equally horrified by Chios and began to sit up and say, actually, you know, can European governments sit back and let this kind of thing happen? Which is one of the ways in which Europe becomes involved in the Greek revolution, which we haven't talked about, but <laughs> perhaps that may be for another time. Yep. Um, so, so in a way, Ottoman reprisals generate support to the Greek cause and they, they extend, could we say like they, they, they expanded the, the, the extent to which all of Greece uh, became engaged in the revolution. So, I mean, Samos uh, does something, Chios pays for it. So, 
automatically you have two areas involved. Yeah, I mean that and that kind of dynamic is going on all over the all over the Greek speaking world. And again, I mean, you know, the focus is on those areas of actually a rather small area of the geographically dispersed Greek speaking world I was talking about at the beginning. Um, because really all the action is concentrated on the Peloponnese, Southern Rumeli and the Aegean. There are other places where Greeks rebelled in Macedonia, um, in, the, um, in, in, in the, you know, the Northern Aegean coast and in Asia Minor. In the way in the Asia Minor coast, and uh, and of course in the um, what is now Romania, the Danubian principalities. That was an important theater of war right at the beginning. But in all those places, the revolution was stamped out again with you know horrific and exemplary brutality. But in those cases, the brutality worked. Um, another case, tragic in a different way, was Cyprus, where actually there was no revolution. But um, the uh, the Orthodox Archbishop and Ethnarch was um, was beheaded anyway, and you know the um, the higher clergy were um, were hanged. It was a kind of reprisal before the event, just as a kind of warning. Um, so it was you know it was kind of it must I, in eighteen twenty one at the beginning it must have been a knife edge. I mean in greater in about half the Greek speaking world it was brutally and totally repressed. The same is true in Constantinople, where you know, hundreds of um, very well-to-do, very eminent Greeks were either publicly beheaded or hanged, um, including the patriarch of the Orthodox Church, of course. Um, but, it, but in those areas where, once they got through the first weeks and months, and that's the Peloponnese, Southern mainland and the Aegean, by that time, there's no going back because you knew that if you gave up, you know, you, you were done for. And that was one thing I think that strengthened the resolve of the Greeks who had got through that, that initial stage. But it is worth remembering that the area that where the revolution succeeded was relatively small. And that in turn is why the geographical extent of the Greek state when it was first, um, when it first had recognized boundaries in 1832 was very much smaller even than today's Greece. There's only about a third of today's Greece, but a much smaller fraction of the more widely dispersed Greek speaking world before, before 1821. So we have a situation where whether you like it or not, you have to uh, engage in the revolution. Um, but Europeans and the rest of the world, they could choose to what extent they wanted to intervene. So what was this intervention and what steered it? And after the revolution, Proved to be successful. How did that influence uh, world history? Yeah, I, mean, I like the distinction you make there, Greg. You, that yes, the you know the Greeks don't have a choice. They're they're kind of you know in they're they're up in they're in arms and they're um, they're engaged already. It's quite a nice way of putting it. The, you know, the Europeans have a choice. I mean, they're looking on. They're looking in from outside, um, and. Um, the answer is that, to begin with, very small numbers of individuals become passionately involved from the outside. Um, a handful of them, about a thousand probably altogether, um, you know, were prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice, and a lot of those did make the ultimate sacrifice. They actually went to Greece, um, took up arms. You know, Lord Byron is the most famous of, uh, of, of all of those, but there were more, you know, about a thousand, perhaps slightly more, um, who, um, who actually risked their lives and often lost their lives, actually joining in the battle. Um, and they're, they're, these are called the Philhellenes, the, the lovers of Greeks, all of things Greek. And they certainly, they were the, what I think of as the kind of, the kind of wedge in the door that kind of prized open what was originally a very local and specific struggle in Greece to becoming an international affair. The fact that um, 
foreigners were there, um, began to prise it open. But there were also a lot more Philhellenes, um, who are, I think, rather unfairly, sometimes, who are rather unfairly called armchair Philhellenes. But these were people back at home in the United States and in every country in Europe who organized committees, raised money, wrote letters to the press, lobbied their members of parliament or equivalent when they had them, you know, pressure groups. And it was enormously effective. So that by 1826, by which time the Ottomans had mounted a pretty devastating counterattack against the Greeks in, uh, the, in the Peloponnese, the governments of Europe, against all their own instincts, um, which would have nothing to do with the revolution, were really forced to, um, no, first of all, to take notice and then to begin to take a hand. So the Philippines kind of prized the door open. And by 1826, when there's a serious risk that the Greeks might actually be annihilated, um, governments in Europe are thinking, well, you know, our own people are involved. They're lobbying us. We can't really sit back and let this happen. And to cut a long story short, the result is that the British, the French, and the Russians basically got together around the table and, and said, we've kind of got to do something. But the most fascinating dynamic of this is they didn't talk to the Greeks and they didn't talk to the Turks. They talked to each other. And the main objective was to make sure that whoever won none of the three was going to get an advantage over the other two. So it's the triangle of the British, the French and the Russians it's kind of edging around each other, trying to make sure that none gets an advantage out of the Greek revolution. They sent a task force, a naval task force to the Aegean. Um, they take on the Ottoman fleet in the Battle of Navarino in October 1827. They annihilate the uh, the Ottoman fleet, and from then on, two things, success for the revolution in some form is, in, is assured, but also the European powers have taken a hand, and now for them there's no going back either. So the fate of Greece becomes a European matter to be resolved by the great powers of Europe. The solution they came up with was to recognize Greece as a sovereign independent state, which happened in uh, a, uh, an international treaty signed in London on the 3rd of February, 1830. And that for me is the key date after 1821 in the whole story of the Greek revolution, because that's the first moment when the great powers of Europe had, they'd already imposed their will on the Ottomans, so the Ottomans couldn't object to this. They declared that they recognize Greece as sovereign and independent. Now, exactly how sovereign, how independent Greece would turn out to be in the future, that of course is another story, perhaps for another Greek ancestry conference. Right. But um, the fact of that recognition is enormously important because after the American Revolution, then after the failed French Revolution, that recognition of Greece as sovereign and independent was the first new nation state created on the revolutionary enlightenment model in the whole of Europe. And all the other nation states of Europe actually followed Greece. Um, Belgium in 1831, Switzerland in 1848, Italy and Germany 1871, Ireland in 1922, Turkey in 1923, take it right on to you know the break of Yugoslavia and Kosovo in 2008. But um, extraordinarily, Historians of nationalism and of Europe never seem to you know, give Greece its due. I mean, I'm not saying Greek, Greeks or Greece invented the nation state. They didn't. It was an enlightenment idea. It sort of matured during the Romantic period. But it was first tried out by Greeks in Greece. And it was that treaty of 1830 that really empowered them to do that. And at the same time, made the it not a key move, a key, a pivotal point from the old Europe of autocratic empires to the Europe that we know and perhaps love or not so much today of, um, uh, of nation states. 
We have only a few minutes left, but I want to ask one more question or two maybe. Um, could you tell us, like in the eyes of those people in Europe and America who became fond of the, the Greek cause, was this cause against a despotic or a Muslim regime? And then the states, how did they legitimize their intervention as an intervention, um, like again, against uh, a Muslim or a, a despotic uh, empire? Well, there are two different things there. I mean, the, the individual Philhellenes and the Philhellenic movement, um, I mean, it all fitted rather neatly together for them because the enemy were A, Muslim, B, um, <clears throat> Uh, sort of Asiatic, Oriental, um, and uh, I'm sure the third one. But you know, I mean, they were, they were. You know, it was very easy. You know, there was a lot, lot of sort of um, sloganizing about the barbaric Turks and lumping together the Turks of the uh, of the 19th century with the Persians of the first century BCE. So there was a there was a you know the kind of easy identification of enlightened. Um, brackets, query, Christian Europe against Oriental despotism, um, which, which played into, you know, it played into Philhellenic, um, you know, sort of sympathies um, very well. And most of the, most of the Philhellenes, and I suppose this would apply to governments too, um, found it quite easy to identify with the spirit of ancient Greece and this idea that the, this was a war to um, to sort of vindicate, liberate, liberate, and even revive the civilization that they all admired. When you get the great power of diplomacy, it's um, it's a lot more hard-headed and a bit more brutal than that. And um, most of those most of those are pretty autocratic too. So they're not going for the despotism angle at all. Yeah. It's um, I think the key there was that they won the Battle of Navarino. And the Russians won a war against the Turks, fought in the Caucasus in 1829, which meant that the Russians could dictate terms to the Ottomans. Mm -hmm. um, and then the British and the French had to jump in and say, well, we can't have the Russians becoming top dog. So we really need to listen to what the Greeks have been saying all along, which is in the game of power politics, you need an independent Greece as a counterweight to Russia. So that's hard-headed, call it cynical if you will, but it's, um, I'm afraid that's real politique. Uh, I wish we had like one more hour to, to discuss about all this. Uh, as you said, maybe a next Greek History Conference or webinar. Um, again, thank you so much for this. Um, I think it was a, an interesting uh, discussion. I hope it was interesting for you too. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, I hope you found it interesting. I, I hope all you people listening found it interesting too. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, be sure we'll be in touch. Thank you. Bye. Bye.